Good evening. My name is Kevin Bergerson and I am a Programs Manager with the Colon Cancer Alliance. I would like to welcome you to 5FU from A to Z, what you need to know about the most common colorectal cancer treatment brought to you this evening by BTG. 5FU has been around for more than 40 years and much is known about this workhorse drug. Tonight, our guest speakers will cover the history, efficacy, and some side effects of 5-FU, including toxicity issues and much, much more. You will also be able to submit written questions on specific issues during our electronically interactive question and answer session. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded, and about this time tomorrow, you will receive a link to where we have posted the webinar recording so you can look at it again at your leisure. Before we get started, I would like to remind everyone that neither the Colon Cancer Alliance nor our presenter are giving medical advice and no doctor-patient relationship is intended or established. You should always seek in-person medical advice and make medical decisions together with your individual clinician team. It is my pleasure at this time to introduce our expert speaker for this evening, Dr. Jeffrey Meyerhart. Dr. Myhart is the clinical director of the Gastrointestinal Cancer Center at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. He is also an associate professor of medicine at the Harvard Medical School and co-leader of the Center for Colon and Rectal Cancer at Dana-Farber Brigham and Women's Cancer Center. In his research, Dr. Myhart focuses primarily on the influence of diet and the lifestyle and outcomes among patients with colorectal cancer. Dr. Meyerhart is principal investigator of a national clinical trial testing celecoxib as an adjuvant therapy to standard treatment for stage three colorectal cancer and recently became co-chair of the GI committee for the National Cancer Institute Cooperative Group Alliance. He earned his MD from Yale School of Medicine, then completed a residency in internal medicine at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and is a medical oncology fellowship at Dana-Farber. He joined the Gastrointestinal Cancer Center at Dana-Farber and the faculty at Harvard Medical School in 2002. And with that, I'm going to turn the webinar over to our presenter. Welcome, Dr. Meyer Hart. And I'm glad you're here. You're a longtime friend of the Colon Cancer Alliance. And take it away. and Welcome, sir. Great. Thank you, Kevin. And thank you, everyone, for joining the webinar today and, and my thanks to the Colon Cancer Alliance for asking me to participate today. I always enjoy these events and being able to speak uh, to patients and advocacy and, and people interested uh, and supportive of, of research related to Colon Cancer Alliance. Um, so the topic chosen today is to talking about 5FU and I'm going to speak for probably about 20 minutes, uh, just sort of a little bit of an A to Z as the title's called here about what it is, when we use it, what are potential side effects, and, and sort of considerations for patients and physicians uh, in their discussion regarding the use of the drug. So as Kevin pointed out, 5-FU has actually been around for a while. Um, we call it 5-FU, and it actually I was probably practicing a year or two. I've been practicing now 16 years, but a year until till someone uh, actually started giggling when I said that, and I actually never realized that it uh, how it came out when you say 5-FU, but it, it's it's a drug, again, that's been around for a while. It stands for 5-fluorouracil. Uh, it's, it's a generic drug now. It's a drug that actually was FDA approved 60 years ago, um, and so it's been around for quite a while, and you might say, how do we still have a drug that's around for 60 years? Haven't we made advances? And we absolutely have for colorectal cancer, where there are a lot of new agents that are, are used in addition to 5-FU for colorectal as well as other GI cancers, but it is still very much part of the backbone because it is still a very effective agent in this disease. Um, it's used for other type of cancers, and some of them are listed here, breast and other GI cancers, occasionally in head and neck cancer, and it, uh, off, 5 of you itself is given uh, intravenously. Um, there, we'll talk in a few seconds about an oral form. In terms of intravenous, the, the, when 5-FU was first being studied for colorectal cancer now several decades ago, there were various schedules used. You know, one of the classic schedules was uh, giving it five days in a row, once a month, um, to patients. It was what was called the Mayo Clinic Regimen. And part of that history related to that is there were people from the Midwest that were coming 
very far distances for treatment and concentrating over five days, they would then stay in the Rochester for that five days and then come once a month, as opposed to a different regimen that was done in the Northeast, what's called the Roswell Park Regimen, which was an IV infusion uh, on a single day, weekly, often for six weeks in a row and then two weeks of not having therapy. Now, for most part, 5-FU is given through what's shown here, a, a CAD pump or an infusion pump. I always describe it as if you think of the hospital when you have an IV pull, a much smaller version of that that's portable that patients can wear with a fanny pack or a shoulder strap. We often give it with another agent called leucovorin. Leucovorin is like folic acid, it's, uh, it's folinic acid, and it does two things. It both, as it says here, increases the efficacy or enhances the efficacy, and unfortunately also increases to some degree the toxicity. But again, it does make it uh, more efficacious uh, of an agent when given with leucovorin. So generally it's given with leucovorin. There are situations where it's not given le with leucovorin. For example, when we give 5 of you with radiation using one of these CAD pumps, it's given alone because the 5 of you in that setting is to try to enhance the radiation. And with the leucovorin, it's, it's, it's too toxic. So it's and there are situations where you only give it uh, alone, but often with some of the regimens, we'll give it with leucovorin. Now, the oral form of, Cape si of, of 5 of you that's at least uh, uh, FDA approved in the United States is, is capecitabine, and it's still uh, uh, only marketed by uh, a single uh, company, and so the trade name for that is Zalota. It essentially mimics what we when we give 5 of you as a continuous infusion. Um, and it is not given with leucovorin because of sort of the enzymatic process of how it's processed to become the active form. It's a chemotherapy that's, uh, again, a pill. The most common regimen to give it is uh, 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 several, twice a day uh, for two weeks in a row and then a week off. But with radiation, it's given a little different. Sometimes it's given five days in a row or sometimes it's given seven days in a row throughout the entire uh, course of radiation. So there are some different formulation, but the most common way, particularly when it's combined with other drugs, one drug called oxaliplatin, it's given uh, for two weeks uh, in a row twice a day and then a week off. And uh, uh, again, it, it has similar effects to 5 of you and how it works. So in terms of administration, I've sort of alluded this a little to this a little bit. It's 5 of you can either be given by itself, uh, it can be given with leucovorin, but now really for the past decade, uh, uh, both in the adjuvant after surgery to try to prevent recurrences as well as in the metastatic setting, we often combine it with some other drugs. So Folfox is one of the more common regimens. It's 5-FU, oxaliplatin, and leucovorin. Fulfiri is 5-FU, leucovorin, and arinotecan. A regimen that, that had several trials in Europe, and in some settings, uh, I, I think we're, we use, there uh, some practitioners use it in the United States and they're in, the, in the appropriate setting is to combine both oxaliplatin and arinotecan uh, uh, with 5 of and leucovorin, what's called fulfoxiri. Um, capecitabine uh, can be substituted for IV5 FU uh, and uh, given with oxaliplatin, and that's regimens often called Capox or Zelox. Some people don't tolerate capecitabine as well as 5 FU, uh, particularly in the United States, and there's various theories of why that may be, but some people tolerate just as well. It doesn't avoid the need for a portacast because oxaliplatin really should be given through a, a central line. Uh, uh, because when given peripherally, peripherally meaning an IV in your arm, if that IV infiltrates, IV, oxaliplatin can have cause very bad irritation, often uh, uh, burning of the skin that sometimes requires a skin graft. So for that reason, it doesn't avoid a porticath, nor, and it also has an IV infusion, um, but it, uh, you wouldn't use a CAD pump with the 5-FU, so there's sort of plus or minuses to the capecitamine oxaliplatin regimen. In t this is a slide uh, uh, in terms of how 5-FU works, and I, I think sort of the important thing uh, here is it lands up most of 5-FU is, is broken down, and this is what's important. This is a, 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 an enzyme that we'll talk about in a few slides, DPD. Um, that's what uh, is excreted, the active form, uh, which has uh, th uh, uh, um, metabolites that affect RNA and DNA damage and lead to cell death, and it inhibits this 
protein, uh, or sorry, this uh, uh, enzyme thymidin delete synthetase. And, and these two in the red are actually somewhat important related to potential toxicity, which we'll get back to. So it's an anti-metabolite. It basically interferes with DNA replication. Um, this leads to cell death. It is what's called a cytotoxic agent. So cytotoxic are trying to kill cells. There are also agents called cytostatic to try to sort of suppress growth. Um, capecitabine, again, works similarly. It sort of enters the process a little differently. It's a three-enzymatic process through the liver to become the active form of 5-FU. Um, it, there are some warnings in terms of when uh, not to use 5-FU. So 5-FU, uh, again, has been around for decades. Um, it should not be used in, in, in uh, pregnancy or, or breastfeeding or plans to get pregnant, but it, does, it shouldn't also affect sort of people who are done with therapy, uh, their ability to have children later in life, or uh, 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 cause birth defect after you're done with therapy and you know what is exactly the right time frame to be off the therapy till till it, it's safe is, is not totally defined but it's not something that later in life should cause problems with a pregnancy and again it's been around so long that that's pretty well known now when if it's given with certain other agents that may affect some of what I just said but five of you alone doesn't really uh, 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 suppress the ability to have uh, become pregnant or or father a child uh, later in life. If you uh, have a previous allergic reaction, 5-FU, uh, uh, you, that it, obviously a drug you shouldn't use. Um, uh, as with any chemotherapy, your physician should know what medications you're taking, including nutritional supplements, to be able to discuss if there's any contraindication to this. The, the sort of biggest concern is actually the last line, is if a patient is on warfarin or coumadin, a blood thinner, often used for uh, atrial fibrillation, sometimes used for a blood clot uh, that the patient may experience. There is an interaction with 5-FU, and it's not that you can't have the two together. It's that you have to really frequently measure, and for people on Coumadin, they'll know what I'm saying right now, your INR, which is your blood test to see the level of blood thinning. So that has to be really uh, monitored closely. In terms of potential side effects of 5-FU, so there are gastrointestinal side effects. Uh, so mucositis is sores in your mouth uh, uh, or anywhere along the GI tract. It could be sores in the esophagus. Um, and so that, that is uh, something that 5-FU can cause and, and resolves as the, when the drug is stopped over time. Uh, diarrhea, uh, nausea or vomiting, uh, decreased appetite and taste changes. And, and there's management for most of these side effects generally supportive management and then sometimes if these side effects are bad to have some dose adjustments but there's very supportive meds that can help some of these side effects. As with most cyto or really all cytotoxic drugs, it can affect your bone marrow, so your bone marrow includes your white blood cells that help fight infection, uh, your platelets which help uh, fight bleeding and then uh, uh, your red blood cells which is when people are anemic and what carries oxygen around your body and, and when patients are on 5-FU we will check them uh, these your blood counts frequently to uh, see how uh, they're doing. Um, the in general, 5-FU doesn't cause such depression of these, but there's going to be some patients where it's more significant than those. But again, when it's given with other drugs, that can increase the risk of hemological toxicities as well. Some side effects that are probably a little more unique to 5-FU, and, and the other unique part about 5-FU is how you give it. And as I explained before, there are various ways to give it five days in a row, once a month, which is really rarely used now, a weekly regimen or through a CAD pump, actually relates to what are some of the side effects people get. So this hand-foot syndrome, which is an irritation of the palms and soles of your feet, um, uh, palms of your hands and soles of your feet, is something that really is more common when the drug's given more continuously. So with sort of a what's called a bolus regimen, just a single dose, once a week, you don't see very much hand-foot syndrome. You also don't see many mouth sores. But when it's given as a more continuous, those are more common. People can get various skin irritations. In fact, 5 of you is also used to treat actually certain skin cancers and uh, early uh, pre-basal cell cancers, but it can cause some irritation of the skin as well as blistering. Um, people generally don't have significant hair loss in terms of noticeable hair loss. Um, they may get some thinning that mostly they would notice. Occasionally some people have a little bit higher levels of thinning. Now that will be different if you combine it with other agents. So for example, Fulfiri has much more 
uh, likelihood of having noticeable and significant hair loss in, in up to 40% of patients. And again, it can cause irritation of various mucous membranes, and so people can get watery eyes from it, again, mouth sores. Uh, these are side effects that we see that, that sometimes require adjustments to the doses. There is going to be a small percentage of people who have really significant toxicities, and, and this slide is, is, is entitled Red Flags of Severe Toxicities. So these are toxicities you really need to make sure you reach out to your physician, and, and not necessarily the next day, but if they're really bad, you know, as soon as, you know, as, soon as possible. So diarrhea, more than seven times what is normal for you or incontinence. Is, is a red flag. You know, patients who had colon cancer surgery or certainly rectal cancer surgery may have sort of a number of bowel movements a day, particularly soon after surgery. So this is really a difference of, of whatever your baseline is. Uh, mucositis that's uh, affecting your ability particularly to drink it, as well as to eat, unable to keep things down, vomiting uh, uh, really fairly consistently are all sort of toxicities that you don't want to wait uh, uh, to talk to your physician about because these can all lead to dehydration that can lead to other uh, complications. Um, if you see bleeding or black or tarry stools, and you know, I, I always tell my patients your skin is your barrier uh, to the outside world, and so if you, uh, if you have a, a breakdown of that, that increases your risk of infection. There's obviously pain when you get uh, hand foot syndrome and the redness if you get blisters or bleeding or peeling. So these are all things that you need to talk to your physician about. Again, these are more common as they're given as a more continuous regimen. Um, and so, if, so, for example, if someone's getting five of you in a pump continuously while they're getting radiation, if you start having breakdown in your skin or blistering or pain, you need to let your physician know because we'll often stop the pump for a few days. Or if you're on capecitabine, we may hold the capecitabine for a few days. So again, it's not something you should just sort of stick through. You really want to be able to uh, let your physician know about them. There are, the, the side effects listed here are, are really rare but well described. Um, I think of, of all the rare ones listed here, the most sort of relatively common is related to some heart uh, areas, so you can get um, some arrhythmias, chest pain. The most common of this cardiac, potential cardiac side effect is people can get vasospasm. So that's, think of it like the little blood vessels around your heart that feed the muscle of your heart can kind of spasm a little bit. And it's interesting that is, again, as I said, there's a lot of side effects that relate to how we give 5-FU. So when 5-FU is given as a more continuous infusion through the pump, for example, or capecitabine, vasospasms will be more common, but we're still talking about a very small percentage of people get this, you know, in the 1 to 2 percent or less range will we'll get that. And, and that there are strategies to try to help people uh, if they do get that, um, uh, but, uh, but sometimes it's that you can't give it as a continuous diffusion, you have to give it a different way. The neurological toxicities and sort of the overall organ failure and death are, are really for patients who have real significant toxicities get dehydrated, particularly for the septic shock and, and organ failure. And again, these are extremely rare, but, but ones obviously that if you have some symptoms related to this, you need to let your physician know. Um, so if we think about sort of who gets severe toxicities, so again, in general, people tolerate five of you fairly well, but there's going to be patients who have significant or severe side effects that we've just talked about for a few minutes. If we think about half a million people in the U.S. Uh, per year actually receive 5-FU um, for various different types of diseases, the incidence of significant 5-FU toxicity, you know, bad diarrhea, lowering of blood counts, things like that, you know, is, is somewhere around 10%. Um, if we look at the adjuvant therapy trials, the trials where people had surgery and then they received adjuvant therapy, and the ones that just gave 5-FU alone or 5-FU leucovorin, you know, the listed death rate is, at, you know, death rate while on treatment uh, is 0.8%. So it's, you know, that's where the 1,300 patients come in. Now, yes, a lot of these people, it's because they, for the most part, it's because they had some toxicity and then they had some underlying condition. It's someone who had sort of underlying heart disease they have really bad diarrhea, they get dehydrated, and, and it causes complications of their heart. But again, these are all uh, considerations in terms of if you had toxicities like listed in the previous slide, you need to let your uh, uh, oncologist know. 
So why do people get toxic, these toxicities and why do some people don't? You know, and so I, I think for most drugs, the first statement, the bullet that I had added here uh, is, is true, is that, you know, in general, we dose chemotherapies related to some formula that was, or some dosage that was worked out in very early trials that does account for your height and weight. We generally, for mostly all chemotherapies with a few, we base it on something called body surface area, which incorporates your height and weight. There is not a way to incorporate how your body metabolizes drug. People, all these drugs are metabolized by various enzymes, and, and people have different levels of those. And so that's not able to be incorporated when we dose people. And so that's, uh, you know, one of the reasons for differences in toxicity. Now, in the case of IVU, again, it's been around for so long, there are pr some of the drugs that I showed in that slide of how 5-FU works, you can have a deficiency of those drugs. So DPD and thymidosynthase deficiency can really uh, affect people's ability uh, uh, to metabolize the drug and really lead to increased toxicity. Now, there are some toxicities that also occur because of human or mechanical error. So sometimes there's malfunctioning of the pump or there's dosing issues. You know, I would say that most uh, centers now have really multiple check and balances in place uh, to have double checks of the dosing, double checks of the written prescription. Uh, so these are, you know, factors that we really hope are are minimized to the most. But unfortunately, uh, again, there are errors that occur. But these really should be very rare. Um, but again, it's always reasonable to question the nurse who's administrating it or, or the physician, particularly if you're given capecitabine and you, you had a discussion with your doc that I'm supposed to take three pills twice a day and, and the prescription's writ, you know, written for five pills twice a day. Doesn't make, you know, that doesn't seem consistent with what you heard. Um, you, know, you should talk to your physician. So going a little more about DPD, so DPD is dihydropyrimidine dehydrogenase. Um, it's the enzyme that helps break down 5-FU. Um, the true deficiency is about less than 5% of uh, the population. A partial deficiency is another 3 to 5%. Um, it limits the ability to fully metabolize the drug, which results in excess 5-FU around, and the longer it's around, the more likely it has toxicity. Arguably, it also can increase the efficacy, but but it's the toxicity that we worry about uh, uh, for patients. Um, people who have really severe uh, DPD deficiency, you know, their blood counts really can bottom out. They can have very low blood counts, which puts them at significant risk of infection. They can have a lot of mouth sores. They can have significant diarrhea leading to dehydration. So these are all things that very early uh, warning signs that need to have immediate attention. Um, partial or true deficiencies, detect there are no guidelines on how to best tailor. So there are tests to look at sort of people's level and, and uh, of these uh, of DPD as well as thymine and synthase. The problem is the level itself is not an absolute like can use drug, can't use drug because even when you get some some test result back, it doesn't definitively say what dose you can tolerate. Now, if it's known that someone has DPD deficiency, we certainly will lower the dose initially and then dose escalate up um, uh, uh, if they're tolerating it well. But it leads to the fact that screening for these is, is, is A, not so helpful because it doesn't definitively tell you the dose. It also actually takes a little time for the test to come back. And for a lot of patients, we want to and need to start treatment before we would have a test result. And given that it's a really rare uh, to have true deficiency, um, it's really to some degree a clinical uh, uh, test in terms of how people tolerate the drug. Now, if people do have significant toxicity, will often test to be, because that may have some information that's useful down the line. But again, you know, the, the practice of what to do is really significantly drop the dose. Or there may be cases where you say, I can't continue this drug, and uh, what are the other options for a patient? Um, most of the time, if not severe, treatment can be supportive. So, you know, stopping the infusion, stopping the capecitabine, uh, treating patients with antidiarrheal medications, IV fluids, et cetera. Um, there is uh, a drug that was recently FDA approved, uh, uridine tri triacetate, uh, which uh, has two indications. One is someone has severe or life-threatening toxicity. Um, the other is actually if it was known that someone had uh, an accidental overdose uh, occurred, a misdosing. 
those are the indications for the use of the drug. It, again, it's very recently approved. It's kind of been around for a while. There was a period of time where you had to get it from the NCI and things, but now it is an available drug, but it has to be used within the first uh, four days uh, for it to be potentially effective. So this is sort of like summarizing the various uh, uh, organs that can be involved um, uh, and really summarizes what we've already talked about in terms of uh, potential organs that can get involved by 5-FU uh, toxicity. And then again, potential things that can be done, uh, mouth sores, oral rinses, uh, viscous lidocaine to help with the sores in terms of pain, washing with baking soda or or, um, or sorry, rinsing with baking soda or salt water uh, uh, can be helpful. Anti-diarrheal medication, anti-emetics, uh, um, some blood tra cell transfusion if you have significant anemia associated with it. Uh, various there's growth factor support medications for white blood cells. Um, so again, you know, I, I would say the list here of supportive medications is probably the most common. Maybe some IV hydration for some patients. The sort of life support type things are really extremely rare patients that have this related to 5-FU. So in summary, 5-FU is the backbone for treating all stages of colorectal cancer. The toxicities 5-FU can range in severity. Again, I would say don't ignore red, red flag symptoms. I also want to ignore other symptoms. If, you know, I, most physicians will talk about sort of how to manage side effects uh, uh, before starting the drug. But again, if, if those tools that you've been given to help with uh, side effects are not working for you or, uh, or side effects that you hadn't talked to about your physician, you need to call and, 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 divide and figure out a plan and figure out what we should do about the drug as well as how to help you support until the side effects improve and then, and then a strategy if you have more treatments left to go. Um, uh, that's, those are my comments that I was going to make. Um, I think, again, I think Jane's going to talk for a little bit and then we'll open up to questions. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Meyerhart. Um, we're going to switch it over here to uh, Jane Harwood. Um, and she's, uh, I want to remind everybody that we're going to have some questions right after Jane here. So uh, get those ready for us. Um, right now, it's my pleasure to introduce our guest survivor speaker for this evening, Jane Harwood. Uh, Jane is a 59-year-old recurrent metastatic colorectal cancer patient living in Atlanta. She was diagnosed stage 3A in March 2014 and received adjuvant Folfox chemotherapy, which contains 5-FU. Jane developed severe toxicity after just one dose of Folfox. She was tested and found to be partially DPD deficient and having the most common mutation. Jane did not recover from the toxicity to complete the adjuvant Folfox in the time window that would have lowered her chance for recurrence. After several months, she did fully recover from the toxicity, but unfortunately, the next year, her cancer recurred to distant lymph nodes. It was very hard for Jane to get the nerve to try 5-FU again, but after much study and investigation, she did and just successfully finished 12 rounds of Folfox with a 50% dose reduction of 5-FU. She's here tonight to share her experience of severe 5-FU toxicity and some information that might help you avoid it or recognize it early on. Welcome, Jane. It's a pleasure having you here this evening. Go ahead, Jane, and if you want to unmute your mic so everybody can hear you, that would be great. Let's see. Can you hear me now? Yeah, you're all set. Go for it. Oh, great. Hi. Yeah, oh, Kevin, thank you. I'm so glad to be here tonight to share my uh, experience and hope that it might help others. Um, when I was diagnosed with uh, 3A during an emergency appendectomy, and at that time I was in excellent health. Uh, I'd had no symptoms, so it was a real shock to me. And then my life turned into a panic whirlwind of doctor visits and second opinions. And all the doctors agreed that as I had one lymph node testing positive that I would benefit from adjuvant therapy with full box. They also said it was generally well tolerated. and I shouldn't lose, lose my hair and on my off weeks, I might even be able to play tennis still, which I love. Um, 
my doctor's office had an education session for me before I started and the nurse went over the common side effects, uh, which didn't seem all that bad. Uh, but after the, after the uh, 5-FU uh, pump, after my 5-FU pump was disconnected, uh, I was very fatigued and a little nauseous and my uh, mouth started burning the second day and I had painful urination. I called my doctor's office and he gave me some magic mouthwash and this was over the weekend. But on Monday, my mouth is still burning and I was also still very tired and had no appetite. Uh, and later that week, my lips became covered in very painful sores. So I called the nurse and I asked if this was normal and they said, everyone is different and suggested I have uh, get some cream at the drugstore. Uh, so it looks like we've lost uh, uh, Jane. Of uh, We're going to have to have her come back in and call back in. That's fine. That sometimes happens. So uh, we'll, if we get her back, we'll love to hear the rest of her story. But right now we're going to go into some of the uh, questions and answers here. Um, we always envision these webinars to be electronically interactive, interactive, and at this time we're going to take some of your written questions. To submit a question, click on the small plus sign located next to the word questions on the right side of your screen. Type your question and then hit enter. If we're unable to get to your question tonight, we will respond to you by email. The first question comes tonight uh, from Jennifer, who is a 36-year-old stage 4 colon cancer survivor diagnosed at the age of 30 with tumors in the sigmoid colon and liver with peritoneal seeding. Jennifer underwent nine months full fox every two weeks uh, with 48-hour pump with weekly Herbitex. She then had HIPEC with RFA to her liver and then one year of Zolota for maintenance. She has, she has been over four years cancer-free and almost three years off of chemo. Um, Dr. Myhart, her primary question is, what are the long-term side effects of all that treatment, and how can she, she help her primary help her? Um, she mentions pain in the shoulder, hands, feet, back, and uh, pelvis. Sure. Um, Jennifer, thank you for the question. I'm going to tackle the first part of that question. I, I think it's probably not the right setting sort of ask, you know, about sort of, you know, be able to answer specifically your situation in terms of kind of what to do next, but I think the first part of the question is a real, you know, is relevant to maybe a lot of people in terms of sort of what are potential long-term side effects of, of, of some of these treatments. So, um, I, you know, it's, you've obviously had uh, uh, multiple treatments. The uh, chemotherapy component of that was full FOX. Uh, which, as I spoke earlier, is 5 if you look over an oxaliplatin. Um, again, there's not long-term side effects of 5 if you per se, for the most part. Um, there are certain chemotherapies, certain chemotherapies used for breast cancer, for example, where unfortunately there's a risk of leukemias down the road or myelodysplasia, kind of a blood disorder. Those we don't actually see with 5 if you or oxaliplatin. One of the biggest problems with oxaliplatin uh, is... Uh, that it um, it can cause uh, uh, neuropathy, as people know, and and uh, uh, who've who've been on it, and and that unfortunately can be a long-term side effect. That the data would suggest will get better over time, but that time can be months and years. And unfortunately, there's probably some, some patients who are going to have residual neuropathy that won't fully resolve. In fact, the trial that Kevin mentioned earlier that I was involved in, looking at celecoxib, there's actually two components to that trial. This Second is looking at duration of adjuvant therapy, so chemo after surgery, three versus six months. It used to be we gave 12 months of chemotherapy, and then there were trials that showed six months was uh, equal efficacy to 12, to, six, to 12 months. And this is actually an international effort in which 13,000 patients uh, 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 participated and, and were willing to be randomized to three versus six months of therapy. And we actually may know that answer at the beginning of next year in terms of if three months is good. And what we do know about oxaliplatin toxicity is the more you get, the more likely there could be potential toxicities. You know, high pack therapy, which is for people who don't know, is is basically or, or for the, the, the sort of 
debulking in high pec is a large surgery to try to remove tumor in the abdominal cavity, what we call the peritoneum, and, and sometimes chemotherapy is given at that time. And that um, uh, can have some side effects in sort of organ function and uh, sort of digestive functions, all of which, you know, surgeons that, are, that do that type of surgery have some, some uh, um, uh, options that uh, talk about in terms of feeding and things like that, but in, in terms of the sort of long-term side effects uh, of the chemotherapy, I think I talked about them. Hold on. It's probably going to come. All right. Uh, very good. Uh, Jane, were you able to call in? Uh, I, Ashley, I think I'm back on. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're doing much better now. Oh, great. Great, great. Maybe it was my connection. I don't know where I, I was dropped off. You were right at the beginning of uh, starting to get your DPD tested. Okay. Uh, so, can. Uh, Right, showing my DPD test? Sure. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, I had, as I said, I had wished I had this information before I had uh, chemotherapy. So I wanted to, in case anyone else was interested, show my results so you get an idea of what they look like. They're a little blurry, but I think you can get an idea. and You can come back and look at it later. And the next uh, slide is uh, some information about my test. Uh, Kevin, can you go on to the next slide? And my insurance covered it. I don't know if it would have prior to my toxicity. Uh, it cost about, it was billed at $220. Uh, my insurance company was charged 60. That was two and a half years ago. Um, it was done as a blood draw at my oncologist's office and sent to Quest Labs, and it took about eight days for mine to come back. Um, your lab, your oncologist may use another uh, another. I am embarking on a new treatment with any drug. The same, I do the same thing as I do each time I take off in the airplane with my husband, in the little airplane that we own with my husband who's the pilot. Now, I'm not a pilot, but I act as co-pilot on that takeoff checklist. I know what's on it, and I check every item off with him. My life depends on it. Now, I do the same with my oncologist. I'm the co-pilot. I research that drug. And I discuss and check off my list of the warnings, patient counseling information with my doctor to make sure I understand it because my life depends on it. And I have a couple of sites that I use when I'm trying to research the drug to be ready to meet with my oncologist. The first is the Daily Med site. Uh, Kevin, if you could put up that slide. They're the official provider of FDA label information, and it's the most up-to-date, and it's also really nice because they have no advertising. I did find that when I searched the drug, it was better if I put in the brand name of the drug, which you can get searching Wikipedia. It seemed to have the most up-to-date information. There will be several drugs you might want to check to make sure you're getting the most current one. Uh, and here's another slide, uh, which Kevin will bring up that shows some of the important things I look for on that label, and this just happens to be the one for 5FU. With the warnings that pertain to me, there's several more, but I go over the warnings and precautions, the overdose, and the patient counseling information. Um, and the other side I go to is this one. I don't even want to try to pronounce it when Kevin puts up the next slide. But what it lists is any dosing guidelines that the Clinical Pharmacogenetics Consortium has for drug. It was good I did this as I am also positive for a genetic mutation that affects the dosing of arena t which I am now also on. Um, Kevin, that concludes my talk. Uh, thank you very much for your time. All righty. Well, thank you, Jane. Um, sorry, yeah, I'm, we're, that was unfortunate. We had a little bit of technical issues with the sound, but that sometimes happens when we use the internet here. But 
uh, we're going to continue with our questions and answers at this time. And um, if our next question comes to us from Maxime, who is also a stage four colon cancer patient. Maxime uh, had been on full furry every two weeks since 2014, has been going home with a, a pump all that time. Um, earlier this week, she went for another treatment and her clinician team changed her pump to something called a dose fuser. When she asked why, she was told Medicare does not cover the pump any longer, and her pump was replaced with the dose fuser. She was wondering, Dr. Myhart, if you have any feedback on that particular device. Yeah, no, I'm not sure. I, I, unfortunately, I don't. I don't know. I mean, it is, you know, the, the one issue with the – so interestingly, you know, a little bit of background, um, when – we started doing combination therapies with both oxaliplatin and arinotecan, and particularly with arinotecan initially because that was FDA approved before oxaliplatin. Um, in the U.S., uh, the regimen that was given was similar to what we were more familiar with in the U.S., which was giving a bolus regimen, just five of you as a sort of a once a week. And so this regimen called IFL came about, uh, um, which was a weekly regimen of five of you, IV, Five of you, Lucavorin and, and Arinotecan. In Europe, Fulfiri and Fulfox were very were much more commonly used, and it, some of it is because of our lack of familiarity with pumps and lack of, you know, having them and insurance coverage and etc. When Fulfox came about, it it was clear that giving Fulfox uh, with an infusion was a better way to do it than a bolus. And also, what became clear is IFL was actually pretty toxic, and Fulfiri was less toxic. So that's where practices started getting pumps and organize, you know, and insurance coverage, et cetera. But, you know, there is still a limit to how many pumps, and, and yes, there are certain providers that have some differences in what pumps they'll cover. I don't know that particular product. I apologize, and I, I don't know what's different. I think it's certainly a reasonable question to ask uh, her oncologist or the oncology team, maybe the oncology pharmacist, if there's any difference. Uh, those are all reasonable questions to ask, but I'm not familiar with that product. I apologize. Okay. Our, uh Next question comes from BTL, who would like to know how can uh, they work with their oncologist to get circulating DNA and tumor DNA blood sampling done to determine if 5-FU or Zolota is working, rather than waiting for scans and MRIs and those kinds of things twice a year. Uh, wouldn't liquid biopsies immediately show the oncologist if Zolota or 5-FU is working and when? Sure. So, uh, so it's a good question, and, and unfortunately, it's a question we don't know the answer to yet. Um, so, I don't know exactly what setting uh, the 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 person who asked that is. If, if we're talking about an adjuvant setting or a metastatic setting, but I'll try to address both. So, the um, in it, for someone who has metastatic disease, in general, the way we see if a therapy is working for them is we repeat imaging. We also use CEA testing, which is a Think of it as like a little protein that gets shed in the blood called carcinoma embryonic antigen, CEA. And not everyone with metastatic disease will be elevated, um, but for those where it is elevated, it often will correlate with the CT. I personally don't use CEA alone. I use it in conjunction with a CD, CT scan to see how uh, therapy is working for a patient. I don't make decisions just on the CEA alone. In the case of adjuvant therapy, there's nothing to see on a CT scan. We do follow a CEA to see if patient's disease is is still uh, looks like it hasn't recurred. It's not a perfect test. 20% of people who have metastatic disease it will not be elevated, so it's not the best. You know, it's not the uh, definitive way to follow someone, but it's one of the better. You know, it's one of the ways we have, to be honest, uh, uh, to be able to follow people every several months. In terms of uh, other tests. So the first things that came about was, could, are there, just like there's circulating protein called CA, is there circulating tumor cells, what are called circulating tumor cells, CTCs? And that was a hope that those would be a way to follow both how people respond to treatment by measuring number of cells and to look at recurrence. It lands up for multiple cancer types, including colorectal, that probably not as helpful for multiple reasons. In fact, most people had very lo low levels of of circulating tumor cells, and it just wasn't a helpful test. But what's evolved is circulating free DNA uh, is actually a little easier to measure. But, in ter but there's several 
there's several settings where it's really, it's still a very active area of research. And yes, there are commercial tests, but I think we still don't really know how to use it. So the several questions are related to the question that was asked was, you know, can this be used to follow if someone recurred? Or can it be used to follow someone who's receiving treatment? And for metastatic disease, a way to follow that disease. And that's really just a little bit unknown. The other actually, is, which is also a, a sort of a really, uh, we think going to be a very important area, is we know cancer cells are normal cells that things went abnormal and, and mu those things are mutations. And there's over time several mutations that eventually lead a colon cell to become cancerous. And at the time of initial diagnosis when a patient has a biopsy, we can test for some of those things. And, and some of them are very relevant to certain treatments that we use today. So RAS uh, is a gene that if it, there's mutated, a set of drugs called cetuximab, which is Herbitux, or panitumab, which is Vectimus, will not work in. Uh, there are patients who have what's called a BRAF mutation, of which there's some strategies to try to help treat those type of cancers. But what we also know is as cancer cells keep growing, some of those mutations may change over time. And one option is obviously just keep rebiopsing a patient. But the other is can we use circulating free DNA to be able to measure if there's different mutations that are emerging? And again, this is still really an area of research to really understand how to, even though there's commercial tests available, how to really apply it to a patient, I think we don't know. So again, the several setting is can we follow for recurrence? Can we follow people's, uh, how people's tumors are responding? And, and really, I think as much of an exciting area, if not more, is to say, can it be used to kind of know the status of someone's tumor, if it, particularly the fact that it may have changed, as we think about the next treatment for a patient? Okay. Uh, we got a number of questions we're going to try and sneak in here before we run out of time. Um, there was a question here that said, why should aspirin be avoided whilst on 5-FU? Is it because that's a, a blood thinner? Yeah, I mean, I, it, you know, I, I, it, it, it's, uh, so I, I would say it doesn't have to, you know, I think it's a, I, I actually, you know, the, the way the slide's written is to talk to your physician about it if there's concerns regarding a patient's platelets, but it's not that, it ha you know, someone who has a, car a cardiac condition, you know, you know, if they need aspirin, um, uh, they uh, should certainly continue their aspirin if they discuss it with their physicians. And and there are now studies looking at, you know, one of the study we have, which is celecoxib, which is not aspirin, and celecoxib, which is a COX-2 inhibitor, that actually doesn't affect platelets, but uh, but there are also studies looking at aspirin. Could that also have an anti-treatment effect? So it, it's really that it has to be used with some caution if someone's platelets drop from the 5 of you. It's not that it's necessarily contraindicated. Similarly, as I pointed out, Coumadin is probably a, you know, it's something that people may need to continue, but it's just monitoring that, uh, the INR with that. So I wouldn't say that you have to, I wouldn't stop taking aspirin. Certainly, if you're taking aspirin, you're receiving 5 of you. It's really a discussion with your oncologist. Okay. We have a question here regarding uh, TIS-102, which has um, maybe been described as a cousin of 5-FU. Is that somewhat accurate? And if so, how are these drugs similar and how are they different? Yeah, so it's actually TAS-102. The trade name is Lonsurf, and for those not familiar, it's a, a, a drug uh, that actually was in Asia before uh, receiving FDA approval here. It, uh, it, I think a, a very reasonable way to say it is, is it's sort of like a cousin to 5-FU as well as escape cyber. It is different, um, but it, it affects the sort of same pathway, and it's an anti-metabolite. Uh, uh, like 5 if you is. So there's some similarities in terms of pathway that, that it affects. It was tested in the setting or the, the FDA approval in, in the, the what we call registration trial, which is the trial the FDA used to approve the drug, was in the setting in patients who had received all other standard chemotherapies for colorectal cancer, who have metastatic, it's for metastatic disease, it's not in the adjuvant setting, for metastatic disease, who received all the other standard therapies, including 5-FU, including Rintikin, including Oxaliplan, including Bevacizumab, uh, which is uh, Avastin, and including for patients where it was, where it was appropriate to use an EGFR inhibitor, Cetuximab or Pantumab, uh, those who do not have a RAS mutation, 
Uh, so it's those patients who received all those standard drugs. And for most of those patients, they had probably several regimens with 5-FU. They may have gotten Fulfox, and they got Fulfiri, they may have gotten Cape Cytobine. And, and the setting was CAS-102 law and surf compared to placebo, and there was some, uh, there was a survival benefit. It's clear that some patients benefit. Unfortunately, some patients don't. Um, what it, why it works in someone who's already received, for some people, you know, months, if not several years of 5-FU is a little unclear. Does it somehow reverse some of the resistance that eventually develops to 5-FU? It's a little unclear. But again, it has some similar effect, but it is used in the setting of people who have already had 5-FU. Okay. I have a question here uh, from Susan uh, who says she tolerates 5-FU well but had stopped oxaloplatin and more recently Avastin due to toxicity. She's worried that her significant metastatic tumor load will increase rapidly in the absence of Avastin, uh, but she reflects that her teeth are in you know, need of some attention as a result of the therapy. How effective is Phytofu alone in the presence of soft tissue tumors, lymph node tumors, and multiple sub-centimeter lung nodules? And is it advisable or foolish to take a long-term break from Avastin in order to prevent uh, prevent failure to heal from the uh, dental procedures? Sure. So, um, uh, you know, I'm going to try to do be, be as general in answering that as as I can with, and, you know, again, not sort of giving advice for an individual situation, which I think is important. Um, so a little bit of background is the way drugs were or combinations uh, were initially tested for people who had metastatic colorectal cancer. And again, at the time, 5-FU was around for quite a while with leucovorin or a, another modulating agent, um, and that was the only choice. And the general paradigm was you treated patients as long as it was controlling disease or if toxicities became limiting. And, um, and, and when these relatively newer combinations with arinotecan, with oxaliplatin came about, adding Avastin with the Tuxmap. The general paradigm for clinical trials was similar. You stayed on the drugs as long as they were working, and then if they stopped working or tolerability, then you would think about other options. That wasn't the, how drugs, for example, for lung cancer or chemotherapies for lung cancer were initially developed. For lung cancer, people received four or six cycles of treatment, then stopped and watched. And um, and that was considered a reasonable strategy. That was the strategy used, and then there were randomized trials that showed that's a reasonable strategy. Now, for lung cancer, it's actually changed a little bit because now there's maintenance therapy and there's uh, some other therapies to use. But for uh, colorectal cancer, various strategies come about, and some of them evolved because of the issues of neuropathy from oxaliplan. Because as, you know, the oxaliplan clearly has benefit for people's tumors, uh, some patients' tumors. But unfortunately, a, a really large number of patients will eventually develop neuropathy that can be limiting in their continued use of it. And so the strategies that developed were, let's use Folfox for a while and then stop and maybe just continue 5 if you look and Or maybe even take a full treatment break. And so there have been various trials that looked at this, these strategies, whether continuous treatment, sort of all, all stuff continued, dropping some of the drugs, when continuing something like maintenance therapy, some people call it chemo light, or really taking a treatment holiday. And depending how you want to look at the data in which trial, you can argue each of those strategies is very reasonable for a lot of patients, um, that overall at the end of the day, survival is not compromised. Now, again, individual situations are different. Um, some, you know, some trials suggest maybe at least doing some maintenance therapy is better than a full treatment break. But for, you know, what I also always emphasize is when we treat metastatic disease, one of the, it is a definitely needs to be a balance with trying to improve how patients feel, improve survival, but maintaining quality of life. And quality of life may be maintained very well with maintenance therapy, may be maintained very well with just combination, or in the importance of taking sometimes some treatment breaks. In terms of the specific question regarding Avastin, again, some of those strategies have used maintenance Avastin. Some have not used maintenance Avastin. Avastin has some benefits in patients, and the initial trials that led to its FDA approval were all very exciting 
in terms of the initial the registration trial, it, it really had a significant increase in overall survival, median overall survival, so on average how people did. But it was using that, that combination that I talked about a few minutes ago, IFL, the arenatic and 5 even and given on a weekly basis, a very toxic way and a less efficacious way to give it. When it's been used with full Fox or full Fury, again, it adds some benefit, but it's probably not as great as initially thought. So again, I'm, say, I'm not arguing that it's not an important drug, but for a lot of patients, it's a modest improvement. And for some patients, it probably doesn't add anything to chemo, and some people, it adds much more to chemo. So again, I think if, if there's a reason to stop the Avastin because of bleeding, certainly because of, you know, Avastin has some extremely serious side effect, heart attack, stroke, uh, perforation of the bowel, and there are really contraindications to starting it again, or for wound healing issues, I, I think those, again, have to be balanced with, with uh, and important to, to consider that it's okay to stop for a period of time. But again, these are issues that definitely talk to your physician to sort of weigh those differences. Okay, very good, Dr. Myhart. That, you know, that was a very com uh, complex question and a very well-rounded answer. The, we are just about out of time for tonight, and there are a number of questions that were, did not get asked. I will be reaching out to those of you who ask questions by email. Uh, with the answers. We will answer those questions and follow up with those answers directly to you, the asker, with the email in the days following the webinar. But we are out of time. And as a reminder, um, about this time tomorrow, you will get a follow-up email with a link to a survey to let us know how we did. We apologize for the connectivity issues here. That sometimes occurs with the internet. But we sure do like appreciate and appreciate your feedback and let us know how we can do better. We're particularly looking on ideas on future topics. Uh, before we go, if you have, any of you have any challenges or other treatment questions you may want to ask in a more personal one-on-one -on -one setting, you can always speak directly with one of our certified patient and family support navigators by calling our helpline at 877-422-2030. And you can also visit them online. And we have a, a new live chat feature. You can chat with them directly online via your computer. Um, finally, please join us for our next webinar next month on Thursday, November 17th um, at 7 o'clock Eastern Time when two of our Colon Cancer Alliance patient navigators present Managing the Financial Burden of, Col and, uh, of a Colon Cancer Diagnosis. Registration is coming soon, so stay tuned to our website, ccalliance.org. And once you're there on our website, visit the news and webinar area located in the get information section and, and register now. I'd like to thank everyone for attending. Um, we hope that you enjoyed this webinar and I'd like to thank our sponsor BTG whose invaluable support made this webinar possible. I'd especially like to thank uh, Dr. Meyerhart and Jane for being with us this evening. We appreciate your expertise and your experience in helping our patient community. It was very informative. If you have any last parting information you'd like to uh, share. Nope, thank you very much for allowing me to do it and thanks for the active participation in your audience and thank you, Jane, for sharing your story. Oh, thank you, I was very glad to do it. Very good. Uh, as a reminder, this webinar is recorded and all of you will get a link tomorrow to the recording so you can look at it again at your convenience. If you'd like to like or write to us by email, please forward your questions and comments to me at kbergerson at ccalliance.org. And on behalf of the Colon Cancer Alliance team, and I'd like to thank everyone for attending this webinar. I hope you found it informative and value added. Uh, please have a good evening and take care of